think we're live on both. Yeah. All right, guys. So it's gonna be pretty informal tonight. You know, we're definitely have time for Q and A afterwards, and I'll stay until the last question is answered. Um, but I want to thank Oscar Strong for inviting me tonight to give this presentation. So I'm Dr. Michael Twyman. I'm a biohacker. I'm the uh, heart attack prevention expert of St. Louis. And tonight we're going to talk a little bit about how we can biohack your heart in ways, but also kind of how to optimize your longevity through optimizing your nutrition, optimizing your exercise, optimizing your stress management, and optimizing your sleep. So we were starting before the, the video went live, but this is uh, Bhutan. Bhutan is this very lovely country. Uh, my wife, who's in the audience, wanted to go see this area. I did too, but uh, Bhutan uh, apparently has some of the happiest people in the world, and she wanted to know why are these people so happy. So I was like, cool, we'll sign up for this trip. Um, but it's a 14-hour flight to get over there. And I'm like, uh, I'm going to die from jet lag. How do I get over there and not die from jet lag? So you know, as a physician, I knew what melatonin is, and you could pop melatonin. Maybe that helps with jet lag. But I wanted to know, like, what else could you do? So I started doing some internet research and stumbled upon this blog that talked about these glasses. And we'll definitely get into the blue blockers uh, going forward. But had this article about if you wear these glasses, you potentially uh, will improve your circadian rhythms and your ability to beat jet lag is going to be enhanced. I was skeptical, but I was like, what's up, you know, what's the risk? You know, I'll just look silly on the plane. You know, I'll show you that picture in a second. But um, so since I bought these glasses, we got on the plane, we fly to Hong Kong and then fly to Thailand, and fly to Bhutan. Um, and you know, it's whatever, well over 14 hours of flying. Uh, we ultimately get there. Uh, then I also do some earthing and grounding, which I have no idea the science behind it at that point. So we're out, you know, side, you know, standing in the grass and we're like, is this enough? I don't know. We do it for like five, 10 minutes and then like, okay, well, let's, let's go explore uh, uh, Thailand for the day. And yeah, we were tired and kind of dragging, but you know, we did what we needed to do that day, had an early dinner, early bed. And by the next day, I felt like I was almost back to my normal self. I was like, that's absolutely amazing. Cause usually you fly that far, you're usually kind of wrecked for two to three days. I was like, there's something to it. I don't understand the science yet, but I'll read up on it later. And then that really opened up the uh, Pandora's box of uh, where I'm at today. Um, so I've been doing this for about three years now. Um, I'm a classically trained cardiologist, did all my training here in St. Louis uh, at St. Louis University. Took a four year hiatus for the US Navy, served uh, in Beaufort, South Carolina. Went back, did some cardiology training, did conventional cardiology for a little bit, but really got interested in preventive cardiology because I wanted to get to the root cause of why people were showing up sick in the first place and trying to prevent them from getting worse. And so I really started down the, the pathway of nutrition first. Nutrition's important, but I'm gonna show you that there's other things that are as important as nutrition. And so I was doing mostly advanced lipid testing, which we'll talk about for a couple of years, and then really fell down the rabbit hole in 2014 about advanced testing to find heart disease at a much earlier stage. And then added on this biohacking component about three years ago, which I kind of say is, you know, I can do conventional medicine, I can do integrative functional medicine, and now I can do this biohacking or quantum medicine, where I'm really getting to the, you know, cellular level of how to repair somebody. And we'll definitely talk about the mitochondria coming up. So this is me at Osteo Strong, uh, I think it was just even earlier this year, it's at uh, the Creep Court location. So, about two years ago, I started the St. Louis Biohacking Club. Uh, for a while, it was just my wife and I and maybe like two other people, and we would try to meet monthly and talk about some biohacking topic. Usually it just turned into like an Ask Mike Anything type of event, and then we'd bring some of our biohacking gear and just play around with it. And uh, I brought a couple of things tonight, and uh, we can show you at the end, but uh, initially that was how it was kind of show and tell. And then eventually, Austria Strong's moved in, you know, I've done some cryo, so we usually go out and do some field trips. But, um, I knew what Osteo Strong was from Dave Asprey, the Bulletproof executive. He had talked about it in some of his podcasts. And then uh, the Osteo Strong, Chesterfield, I'm sorry, the Osteo Strong Creep Core location actually reached out to me and it was like, so I was actually like a biohacking influencer in St. Louis or something. He said like, will you bring your biohacking club to Osteo Strong? I'm like, sure, let's, we'll check it out. So went there, did the demo. You can see me giving the, uh, the instructions how to do it. Um, and then, you know, I know they kind of branded themselves as the ultimate biohack that came, that came from Dave Asprey's world using that word. And I think I have it on the next slide, you know, what is biohacking? So I gotta actually explain that. 
This is Asprey's definition. I have probably slightly different, but essentially it's, you know, changing your environment outside and inside to improve your biology, to upgrade your body, mind, and life. I kind of use it as more, you know, what can you do other than conventional medicine, pills and procedures to optimize your longevity? It's also somewhat kind of self-experimentation. So, you know, you do something, you feel better, you keep doing it. You do something to yourself, don't feel better, stop doing it. And it kind of falls into the kind of the quantification um, world too. So you can have different trackers to know if what you're doing to yourself is helpful or harmful. And you can kind of make faster iterations if you kind of track some of these things. So this is me looking crazy on the plane. It looks like the Unabomber. Uh, <laughs> somehow my wife let me sit by her the whole plane and had the hood up so the light wouldn't get into my eyes. Um, but if you see, at the time and location was 3.03 and where we were flying was 4.03 a.m. So I had an 11-hour, uh, actually a 13-hour jump that I was going. So the way I did these glasses, and I have a ever-evolving uh, jet lag reduction protocol, and I actually have a PDF that I'll eventually share with you guys if you want it. Just email me or follow me on Instagram and I'll give it to you. But essentially, my new protocol is get on the plane. This is mostly if you're flying east because it's eastbound that really kind of messes up your circadian rhythms, which we'll talk a little bit more about. You know, your circadian rhythms is your 24-hour cycle. So essentially, the second you're on the plane, pretend you're at wherever you're going to be. So most recently I traveled, eastbound was Munich. So I woke up in St. Louis at 3.30 in the morning because that was 10.30 in the morning in Munich time. So I went to try to be up decently early for Munich time. Set my watch to start living like I was in Munich, trying to eat meals like what time it would be in Munich. And the second I was on the plane, you know, I lived like I was in Munich. So if it was starting to be evening time, I had these glasses on. I had these glasses on the entire time on the plane, but you know, I was pretending like getting ready for nighttime. And the second it was nighttime in Munich, I switched to these dark red ones. And so I don't care what the lighting is on the plane, I control my circadian rhythm when I'm on the plane. And the second I get to Munich, yes, we end up taking a nap. I'll kind of show you the protocol for the nap too, but once we went to sleep, the next day, felt like I was back to normal for the most part. And then we ended up going to a crazy biohacking conference and meeting Jack Cruz, so that's another story. But, um, but the glasses, they actually have an effect. And if anybody here is actually my patient, they've seen that I've been wearing these in the office for well over two years. You know, when I first started wearing them around, people were, you know, thought I was like, you know, I'll look at that in a second. But, you know, people are like, those glasses, you know, what are they? Are you Bono? You know, do you have something wrong with your eyes? I'm like, no, there's something with like blue light and it might make you sleep. I mean, it might make your mitochondria work better. And they'd be like, what's mitochondria? What's blue light? And so they would just open the conversation. I'd start explaining what all that's about. But, you know, if you have to start about the mitochondria, the mitochondria are the little things inside your cells that make energy for you. The better you treat mitochondria, the better you are doing. So the three places that you have most of your mitochondria are your brain, heart, and immune system. If your mitochondria break, wherever they break is where you get the problem. So yes, I might be a cardiologist by training, but if I can help your mitochondria work here well, your brain function is gonna work well. So 80, 85% of chronic disease may be driven by something going wrong with the energy production in your mitochondria. So essentially, everybody has 24 hours in the day but not everybody has the same energy levels to do what they want during those 24 hours. So the better you treat mitochondria to make energy for you, the better you can do what you want to do during the day. So typically, I talk to patients about the mitochondria um, being the power plants in your cell. So if something doesn't work, you're basically having a brownout. There's things which we'll talk about that help improve the energy production in your mitochondria. The mitochondria used to be bacteria millions of years ago and then two cells got together, the mitochondria shared genes with your cells and blah, 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 blah. But now the mitochondria, they make energy for you. But you only get your mitochondria from your mom. She gets it from her mom. So if somebody sits in my office, that's the family history I wanna know first. Yes, I wanna know about your dad, I wanna know about your siblings, but I wanna know what your kind of starting blocks are. So if your mom lived till she was 95 and was very healthy and your mom's mom lived till she was 95 and never had heart attacks or cancer, you started with a good collection of uh, mitochondria. And so as long as you don't live a horrendous lifestyle, you're likely to have longevity as well. Um, and so it's mostly not baked in your genes. You're, you're not destined to get cancer. You're not destined to get heart disease. It really is 
what you do in your environment, turning these genes on or off. And the better you treat mitochondria, the better those genes don't necessarily turn on that could cause you problems. So these are kind of the four things. If you already do these things, uh, there's much less chance you ever need to see me. So the first thing is see the sun. The sunrise is the most important time of the day to reset your circadian rhythms. Uh, knock on wood, I have not missed a sunrise in all of 2019. Uh, yes, there have been some days when it's negative three outside and I'm still out there, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm not out there as long, but I'm still out there. Uh, so the morning sunlight, there's certain spectrums of light. There's blue, there's red, there's green, but there's not UV. So you're not gonna get a burn, you're not gonna get a tan, you're not making vitamin D. But that morning light, that blue light that comes from the sun, turns on cortisol, that wakes you up for the day. So you do need a certain amount of blue light, but you need it from nature. So that's such your circadian clock for the day. I keep mentioning circadian clocks. That's your, you know, the biggest marker of how healthy you're gonna be is how will you treat your circadian rhythms. And the two biggest things that set your circadian rhythms are how you're exposed to light and the timing that nutrients are coming into the system, which we will get into. But you first set your circadian rhythm during the day by seeing the sunrise. The yellow glasses, the Bono, yeah. If you protect your eyes from artificial light, especially at night, that is, very good for your biology. So artificial light at night can raise your blood sugar, can cause inflammation, definitely can affect your sleep. So artificial light at night includes these things with screens, includes overhead lights, includes your TV. Much of this light is very intense and it basically has four to five times the amount of blue light that the sun has. So that blue light tells your brain it's noon, it's July, you know, stay awake, stay alert, you know, there could be danger. You know, you're not getting ready to go to sleep. So wearing glasses during the daytime, if you're under a lot of artificial light is important, but especially once the sun sets, because once the sun set, up until Edison, those guys invented the light bulbs in the late 1800s, you only had candles or campfires. So you basically only had red light at night. Your body was not evolved to be around this bright light all night long. And it's mainly about melatonin. You know, people have heard of melatonin being in like pills. Can you take melatonin in a pill? Yes, but melatonin's a hormone. You know, if you don't know what you're doing with melatonin, you can actually do some damage to your eyes. So if you take, you know, melatonin short term for jet lag, you're fine. But if it's something that you feel like you need to take melatonin every single night to sleep, that's just a good indicator that it, there's something going on in your environment that you need to take a better look at. Because if you have low melatonin levels, you're going to have poor sleep. Melatonin doesn't necessarily make you fall asleep. Melatonin helps you stay asleep. And melatonin helps run the processes of the mitochondria repairing themselves at night. The medical term is autophagy and apoptosis. Autophagy is like recycling. Apoptosis is cell death. So your mitochondria rebuild themselves at night. Or if they're not working well, they kind of kill those ones off. But if you don't have enough melatonin, that process doesn't happen. And then you basically are working on 10-year-old parts. And so stuff just starts wearing out faster. So sleep is critical for you to have longevity. Sleep isn't the sexiest topic, but we're gonna spend some, definitely some time in talking about sleep quality coming up. But back to melatonin, you make melatonin in your eyes essentially throughout the day as sunlight comes into it, and then you need darkness for about three to four hours before that melatonin gets released from the pineal gland. So people who have a lot of trouble sleeping at night or they can fall asleep but they wake up three or four hours later, not infrequently, it's that they're running out of melatonin to keep running their systems. So you can preserve your melatonin levels by wearing blue blocking glasses. There's also some technology, I think I'll talk about a little bit later, that can reduce the blue light as well. Earthing and grounding, talked a little bit about it in the intro. So earthing and grounding is important um, until 5G goes live possibly, but uh, uh, earthing and grounding, you know, every animal sleeps on the ground except humans. You know, they're sleeping on the ground at night because that helps regenerate their cells at night. So the earth has this negative charge. There's electrons that come from the earth. If you're barefoot on man-made substances, so grass, dirt, sand, you basically will accept electrons into your feet, into your system. It basically powers up your mitochondria without eating. It always sounds crazy until you actually read the science and read Dr. Cruz's work that, no, this is actually how things actually happen. So you can get free energy from the earth if you take your shoes off and are outside.
It's very good for lowering inflammation, it may help with neuropathy or tingling in your feet. There's also some data that thins your blood. Maybe not as strong as aspirin or fish oil, but it gives you some blood thinning effect. And then the water, water is very important. You know, your body's mostly water, but we'll talk a little bit about some of the more optimal waters to put into the system. Um, and then also how water is important to be like a battery. So yes, you eat food for energy, but you can make energy in your cells from the light environment. And the water that you have in your cells is the battery that that light hits and grows the battery. So these two gentlemen, one uh, passed away, one was fortunately resuscitated. So we'll go a little bit into kind of my day job as being a cardiologist, um, and I'll kind of tie in the biohacking part as we go. But these two gentlemen had cardiac events. Neither of them necessarily had symptoms until it happened. So you know, that's why I tell people, test don't guess. You know, if you look at both of these people, you're gonna think, well, the guy on the left, probably pretty healthy. He very narrowly escaped death. Um, Tim Russert, we'll start with him first, NBC newsman who passed away at work, uh, had a stress test two months before he passed away, passed his stress test. What they don't really talk about is he actually had a high-risk CT coronary calcium score. He was on medications, you know, but was he on the absolute optimal regimen? Possibly not, and you can't really second guess his doc. He was on very good things, and he was exercising, he was trying to eat a clean diet, and maybe it was truly bad luck that the plaque that he had in his artery got ruptured. You can't prevent everything, but that they thought that he was completely low risk because he passed the stress test, that's actually a false narrative. You know, stress tests are really good at recreating symptoms. If you're having chest pain, sore of breath, exercise intolerance, well, we put you on a treadmill, see, can we recreate your symptoms? Is your EKG changing while you're exercising? If those things happen, that is a marker that there's possibly a severe blockage in one of the three arteries that provides nutrients to your heart. Parts about the size of your fist, and you got three arteries that sit on the outside of it. If one of those arteries has about a 70% blockage or more, you're likely to have symptoms while you're exercising or pushing yourself. You're not likely to have symptoms at rest because you can get enough 50% of heart attacks or so are caused by blockages that are less than 50%. You can exercise all day long, have no symptoms, but one of these plaques on the artery, they're like little pimples, it ruptures like a little volcano, a blood clot forms, now you've got a 100% blockage, now no nutrients are going to the part tissue, they start dying, things start happening where that's the pain in your chest, and sometimes you have abnormal heart rhythms because of that, and potentially you can pass away. That's essentially what happened to Tim Russert. He had seven cardiac deaths when one of the plaques ruptured in one of his arteries. The other gentleman, um, Bob, I remember his Harper. last, Bob Harper, thank you. Um, was on The Biggest Loser, looks very fit on the outside. He had seven cardiac death at a gym, had bystander CPR, they resuscitated him. He went to the cardiac catheterization lab, they stinted open one of his arteries. He ended up having an abnormal cholesterol particle called lipoprotein A or LPA. 20% of the population has this, and it's genetically inherited, and it definitely increases your risk of having cardiovascular disease at an earlier stage, 10, 20 years before the general population. It's not a test that's checked on your traditional cholesterol panel, but it's very cheap, Quest, LabCorp do it. You just need to know, get it checked. If you have it, you're at higher risk, you probably need to do some more things to lower your risk. At this time, there's not great data that you can lower LPA and lower risk. They're doing those trials and studies. You know, there's certain vitamins, vitamin B3, niacin, does potentially help lower LPA, but doesn't show yet that you're lowering the risk of heart attack stroke. You just know, that person's high risk, I need to take a closer look at them. So I don't always talk about it in this extreme detail, but you know, three levels of prevention. You know, primary prevention is you've never had a heart attack. As far as you know, you don't have any plaque in your arteries. And the whole goal is we're gonna prevent you from ever doing that. I have some technology in my office that can actually show you how healthy your arteries are seven years before you're actually gonna put plaque in your arteries. Secondary prevention is you've actually already had a heart attack, you've had a stent, you've had bypass surgery, you've had a stroke. We know you have plaque in your arteries. We're trying to prevent you from having a second event in your arteries. And tertiary is, actually the secondary, they call it secondary, is that there's plaque in your arteries but you've not actually done significant damage. The tertiary is you've had a heart attack, you've had a stroke, and you'd prefer not to have a second one. So I was talking a little bit about this, um, is that your arteries, 
you know, it's not necessarily like a sewer pipe. You know, I sometimes used to think that was the analogy that, you know, your arteries are sewer pipe and they just fill up all this sludge and now they're 100% blocked and boom, that's a heart attack. But it's actually, it's about the health of the walls of the arteries. You know, on screen left, your artery is very thin. You know, all the way on screen right, the artery is getting thicker, it's calcified, there's all this damaged cholesterol strap, uh, trapped in the artery, and the plaque ruptures. You see like the little yellow goop spilling out in the artery. When that ruptures, your body thinks it's basically bleeding to death. So the body does what the body does best, don't bleed to death. It forms a blood clot. Great, you sealed off that, but you overreact it. And now you've blocked all the blood flow downstream. The tissue downstream starts dying unless you provide more blood to that area. And I mentioned out here, under, you know, there's approximately, you know, I don't know if it's exactly 400, but there's way more than five causes of heart disease. You know, cholesterol is important, but it's not the be all end all of developing heart disease. You know, most people in here have probably had their blood pressure checked, their blood sugar checked, and a traditional cholesterol panel, and you would know if you smoke or if you're overweight. Those might be the top five, but if you have your top five well controlled, there's still 395 things that might be putting the plaque in the arteries. And so that's Bob Harper. You look at the guy, he looks super healthy, but he had LP little a. I don't know for sure if they could have prevented this heart attack, but if he would have gone and had a calcium score a year before that, they would have known he was probably a higher risk and he would need to be watched more aggressively. So this is just a diagram of the heart. Um, there's three arteries that sound the outside of the heart. The artery going to the right side, the artery going down the front side, and the artery wraps around the side. And those are cross sections, kind of slicing like a garden hose. So it's really more important to know how healthy the walls of the artery are. So for many years, you can be building up the plaque, have no symptoms. The plaque usually actually outwardly remodels. So the artery gets bigger outwardly first before the plaque starts growing into the lumen and where the blood flows. And until it closes the lumen off to 70%, you're not likely to have symptoms. So you need to do a test to go looking for the artery plaque. And that test that I typically recommend is called the CT coronary calcium score. This is a low dose radiation CT scan that looks for the calcifications in the coronary arteries. And you can see the little white flecks on there that we got the circle around. So calcium is supposed to be in your bones and teeth. It's not supposed to be in your blood vessels. Calcium in your blood vessels is a late finding. That plaque has been there a while. And your body's trying to repair some of this damage. So the calcified plaque is hard. It's not likely to cause you any problem, but hard plaque always travels along with soft plaque. So if you have a calcium score, I'm sorry, if you have it's approximately 25 to 33% of the plaque is gonna be this hard calcified stuff, but there's gonna be this black soft plaque that you can't see. And typically is that softer plaque that's more vulnerable to causing the heart attack. So if you have a high calcium score, you likely have a lot of soft plaque in the artery as well. It's not common, but if you have a calcium score that's low, you can still have severe blockages in your artery that are all soft plaque that are not gonna get picked up on this. It is not common, but it's not a foolproof test, but it's the best non-invasive test that you can do to tell you, are you likely truly low risk and keep doing what you wanna do from a lifestyle standpoint or supplements, or you're high risk, you should consider doing conventional medicine and everything else to really stabilize the plaque. So what do these people have in common? Um, they all have calcium scores now. So Bill Clinton, he passed every single one of his presidential uh, executive physicals. So every year they'd have him do a stress test. He passed them all. Within a couple of years of leaving office, he ends up having a heart attack, gets a heart catheterization, found to have multivessel coronary artery disease, has to undergo multivessel bypass surgery. How did they miss it? He had all these stress tests. He didn't have a calcium score. He actually had significant plaque building up then. It just wasn't clinically significant until a couple years after he got out of office. So now every president has to get a calcium score test. I'm pretty sure they do it yearly. The astronauts also have to get them. Um, they've grandfathered some of the older astronauts into it, but now if you have a calcium score over zero, they don't send you up to space because there's not a cardiologist in space who's gonna help you out if something goes wrong with your heart. So they use these tests routinely. It's about a $100 test about the same amount of radiation as a mammogram. So who should get them? You know, if you've already had a heart attack, stroke, bypass, stent, you're already high risk. This test is not for you. This is for the people who are more intermediate risk or the people who are being told you should take a medication for your cholesterol. 
this test is a very good tiebreaker to talk about you know, how aggressive you should be with cholesterol lower. Um, if you have an excessively high cholesterol, I'm sorry, if you have a very high calcium score, consistently over 400, you probably need to do something about the lipids because the lipids are getting damaged and they're getting trapped in the arteries. Your calcium score is zero, you're low risk, focus more on the lifestyle. So uh, I'd probably tighten up the day range is just a little bit, but these are kind of the guidelines of the heart attack prevention societies. You know, 45 and above for men, 55 and above for women. You can dial it down a little bit lower. People have a really strong family history. Generally, if, you know, if your mom or dad had heart disease in their late 40s, you know, I will do it 10 years before their parents. Um, and if, you know, if you're like 35 years old, you know, almost always your calcium score is going to be zero. It'd be very rare to have a positive calcium score at 35. But if you've been a type, di type one diabetic for 20 years or you have an autoimmune condition, your arteries are very inflamed, you might have some plaque at that early age. And um, my one colleague who's an individual cardiologist, he's doing more and more catheterizations on people in their 20s, 30s who are having plaque ruptures. They'll just have one artery that's abnormal. They'll have like 150% blockage that ruptures, but he's seeing people with heart attacks in their 20s now. Um, what are the odds that your score is gonna be abnormal? If you're over 40, for the most part, it's six out of 10 people are gonna have some amount of calcium in their artery. If your score is zero, that's great. This is about the only time in your life you want to be a zero. Uh, so a score of zero indicates that you likely have a risk of a heart attack or stroke of about 0.4% over five years. So it's about as low as you can get. You can't get to zero. So people who are zero, I tend to focus mostly continue work on your lifestyle. You know, one in six are gonna have over 400. 400 is a high risk finding. Um, typically over 400, I'm gonna recommend some type of ischemic evaluation with a stress test to see can I provoke ischemia when they're exercising because exercise is so important to helping stabilize plaque. I wanna know can they do exercise safely. And if they have a calcium score over 1,000, they're almost a ticking time bomb in a way. They'd likely have severe plaque among their arteries. Uh, more of a uh, personal experience, you know, I've had probably about 10, 15 patients with scores over 1,000. Um, almost every over 1,000, I will recommend an invasive test where you do an angiogram and go look for how bad this plaque is in the arteries. About half the time I get in there and the artery lumen is wide open. Looks like nothing happened, but the artery is like a concrete pipe. The blood is not being restricted. Yeah, they're still high risk, but the stent isn't going to help them. Bypass surgery is not gonna help them. Work on their medications or supplements in their lifestyle. But the highest score I've ever seen was in a 48 year old man who had a little bit of family history, a little bit of cholesterol issues, um, was on some uh, anti immune therapy for one reason or another. Now, his score was, uh, I believe, about 5,200. I thought it was an error when I saw it, or that he had, you know, like, did you get shot in the chest and there's a bullet sitting in that area because that would throw off the test? Um, but no, his arteries. Uh, look like concrete pipes when we went in there. It was some of the worst arteries I'd ever seen. And the way the waters work, we couldn't fix them with stents. I had to send this guy to bypass the surgery at 47, 48 years old. He's doing well these days. And did I save his life? Possibly, but he would have had no idea he was that high risk unless he did this test. Can I skip this part? All right, so labs. Um, I've been routinely doing these advanced labs for the past seven years couple different vendors that do them, so I'm not beholden to one vendor or the other, and I don't get paid to talk about any of them. Um, but cholesterol, neither good or bad. There's just cholesterol. So, you know, Mother Nature, or whoever you believe in, you know, did not put um, cholesterol into your system to give you heart attacks. Every cell in your body needs cholesterol. It's only when that cholesterol gets damaged do you tend to put these plaques in the arteries. And there's a lot more things you can check than just cholesterol. So. My practice, I routinely check inflammation markers. I talk to my patients, inflammation is basically your immune system turned on. If you get a cut, you sprain your ankle, you want your immune system turned on, repair the damage. But you don't want your immune system on 24 seven. It's carrying all these things called interleukins and such that just are you know, basically going out there to fight the infection. Your arteries can get damaged in that process. They're kind of innocent bystanders. So your arteries become on fire. The cholesterol goes trying to repair any damage from this fire. The fire's going on. The cholesterol is now on fire, basically it gets damaged. That damaged cholesterol is now getting trapped in the arteries until the inflammation goes away and your body can kind of start clearing that. 
So is plaque reversible? It may not be 100% reversible, but definitely you can stabilize it and probably get it to start regressing if you can shut off the fire that's there in the first place. And these type of blood work can kind of help you figure out why it's on fire. I've checked the traditional panel, but I also checked the lipid particles. So we talked about cholesterol being this waxy substance, it's like oil and vinegar, can't float in the blood by itself. So the particles wrap it up, drive it to where it needs to go. So the LDL particles, take it to where it needs to go. The HDL particles, pick it up, take it back to the liver to recycle it. So we talked about LPA, 20% of the population has it. Very simple test to do. I want to know, are you pre-diabetic, diabetic, or just, you know, on the borderline that we need to be considering that you need to do something different to control your blood sugar. So you need to check not only your A1C, which is your 90-day average blood sugar, but your fasting glucose and your fasting insulin, because you can have a normal A1C, you can have a relatively normal glucose, but if your insulin is sky high, that means your pancreas is just working overtime trying to control your blood sugar. It can do that for a few years, but over time the pancreas is gonna burn out and now you're gonna start being pre-diabetic or diabetic. So I'm very aggressive at treating blood sugar dysregulation because it's a whole lot easier to prevent it than once they go on to become diabetic and you're trying to reverse it at that stage. Vitamin D is a marker of how well your immune system's working. It's a very important hormone. Um, low vitamin D is always associated with all coils mortality, meaning if you have low vitamin D for any reason, you're at higher risk of death. Um, it is not as well known. If you supplement vitamin D, are you reducing that risk? That is probably not true. It's just a marker that there's something in your environment that you spend 99% of your time indoors or you're spending too much time in artificial light that's destroying things that destroy vitamin D. Your omega-3s, that's what's in basically cold water fish. Omega-3s are very anti-inflammatory. They have some effect on the lipids. They also tend to stabilize the plaque. So if your arteries are on fire, the omega-3s are helping put that fire out. And there's, of course, a couple of genetic markers you can check that will tell you if you're at higher risk. There's one called a heart attack gene, 9P21. I've gone a little bit away from checking these unless patients have a very strong family history of sudden cardiac death because if I check them, I don't want to necessarily scare the patient and say, you got this gene and you got to be really worried. It's more, let's check the blood vessels. There's no plaque right now. You're doing great. Let's focus on all the things we can reverse. You know, and I said, it's mostly epigenetics. If you do the right things in your environment, that gene might not ever turn on. So the endothelium, I don't always get into this with everybody, but the endothelium is the first thing that goes abnormal when you start developing plaque in your arteries. So the endothelium is the inner lining of your blood vessels. It's one cell thick and it's like an air traffic controller. It basically decides what stays in the lumen where the blood's flowing or what gets it into the wall of the blood vessel. The endothelium, if you lay it end to end, it's about the surface area of six tennis courts. So it's actually one of the largest organs in your body. The endothelium secretes many substances, but one of them is nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a gas that dilates your blood vessels. Nitric oxide is also somewhat like Teflon, prevents stuff from sticking to the endothelium in the first place. So I talk to patients about the endothelium being like a tennis mat. Many times I talk about the cholesterol particles being like a tennis ball where you have big fluffy LDL particles, those things aren't getting through the endothelium as much. The small dense BBs or golf balls, they're easier to get through the tennis net and get trapped in the walls of the artery. So there are invasive tests that my colleagues can do in the cath lab that test your endothelial function, but you should not go get that tested invasively, you know, risk versus benefit. There's a non-invasive way you can test your endothelium and I'm not offering that in my practice. Um, you know, essentially it's a, Two little probes you put on your finger, you're hooked up to a machine for about 15 minutes, non-invasively. It measures how well your arteries can dilate in response to that vascular stress. So you do five minutes on each finger, looks like a little seismograph, should be the same. I put a blood pressure cup on your one arm, blow it up past your blood pressure to cut off flow to that arm, so one of the arms goes flatline for that five minutes. You get that pins and needles sensation in your arm. We open up the blood pressure cuff, blood rushes back down into that arm, and if that arteries that are receiving this huge slug of blood are healthy, they're gonna release a ton of nitric oxide to dilate to get all this blood down in there. So typically, if your artery can dilate to 1.67%, uh, the, the number is 1.67, so 167% of where it was, that's considered normal, but optimal is going over two. So you want your artery to double in size 
and say that means you have a good endothelial response. So this test has been studied at the Mayo Clinic. They have significant correlation data between the cath lab and this working well. So the way that I would use this test is in somebody who's never had a heart attack. They've either had a calcium score test or they have another test we'll talk about in a second that's abnormal. And then we know, okay, maybe this calcium score test is abnormal because something I did three years ago, I've stopped smoking, I've changed my diet, I'm eating right. Have I made my arteries better? I said earlier, that calcium score test might be stuck in time, it might be a snapshot, it might not get better. But as long as it's not getting worse, if you check your endothelium function and it's doing better, your arteries have a better shot that it's repairing itself. If somebody's already had a heart attack and they're on medicines like you know, nitroglycerin, that's already making a lot of nitroxide. So that test is going to be not as accurate for those people. But if they held that medicine, you did the test, and the artery can dilate well, they've likely repaired a lot of the damage that was going on previously. I don't think I have a slide on it here uh, because it's a newer test I'm starting to offer. Um, is a test called the carotid intimal medial thickness scan, or CIMT. It's a ultrasound of your neck artery. So there are regular carotid ultrasounds that I you know, interpret, and that's looking at advanced disease. You're looking for severe plaque in the arteries. But what the CIMT does, no radiation, takes about five, 10 minutes. They measure the thickness of that artery. Your artery is supposed to be a certain thickness as you age. They can basically tell you your vascular age with this test. And if your vascular age is greater than your biologic, your arteries are getting old. You're as old as your arteries. So you wanna do things that regress that plaque. That basically will show you the soft plaque that is likely building up in your arteries. So your neck and your heart arteries are very similar in the way that plaque builds up. You got 60,000 miles of blood vessels through this system. If you have plaque one place, you likely have it in other places. So you need to sometimes look at multiple beds. But I would not put a patient under a calcium score test every year because it may not give you enough information that what you're doing is working. And also you don't want to expose them to repeated radiation without getting a great benefit from it. The carotid scan has no radiation. So you can do that study, get a baseline, make some type of intervention in their lifestyle, their supplements or their medications. And then a year from then, recheck it. If things are going with the way you expect, that plaque should be regressing, their vascular age should be going down. All right, so I think now we're gonna do a little bit more of the biohacking part of it. So sleep is where my kind of area of expertise with uh, sleep hacking, biohacking really comes into. So I mentioned earlier, it's really about your circadian rhythm, so your 24-hour cycle. Those things are dialed in by your light environment and the timing that your nutrients come in. But sleep, even though it might not be the sexiest of topics, it's the topic of longevity. The better you sleep, the better you do long term. Sleep is when your mitochondria are repairing themselves. So I think I had this more for a medical talk initially, but you know, snoring, if you snore, stop breathing, wake up in the morning kind of groggy, headache, and feel like you could sleep the rest of the day, it's possible you have sleep apnea. If you have sleep apnea, you should get tested. There's ways you can do sleep studies at home now that will tell you you should get treated, you treat the apnea, you put less stress or strain on the heart, inflammation goes down, you're reducing your risk that plaque is building up. Sleep apnea is also highly associated with abnormal heart rhythms. So if you have abnormal heart rhythms, make sure you don't have apnea. If you do, get it treated. We frequently talk about the sleep cave. Uh, so where you sleep is when you regenerate. So like I said earlier, animals sleep on the ground. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily sleep on the ground. I actually, I, I violate this one rule. You know, I sleep way up in the sky. Um, <laughs> but typically, you want the room that you sleep in to be the place where you can regenerate. So your bedroom should be ideally dark, quiet, tech-free, and cool. You really want it to be like a cave. So dark, how dark? Can't see your hands in front of your face would be ideal. Uh, so blackout curtains, so no lights getting in. If you need a nightlight, there's night lights that you can get that have red light bulbs that don't affect your night vision. Those red light bulbs won't destroy melatonin. So uh, you know, I'll go offline, I'll tell you kind of where you can get some of those things. But if you need a night light, use red lights or amber lights. Um, you know, do not have your cell phone by your head. You know, your mitochondria basically are like little dish antennas. They're scanning the environment all the time. So we all can see visible light, but we can't see x-rays, we can't see gamma rays, we can't see microwaves but your cells can, they experience that 
And so if your body's trying to repair itself at night and you have your cell phone by your head, your mitochondria are basically getting a cell signal jam and they may not be able to decode what's really going on in the environment. So if you have trouble sleeping, you have nightmares, get your phone away from your body while you're sleeping. It's, there's a physics term called the inverse square law. As you move away, the radiation halves each time you move away. So you know, if you have your cell phone 10, 12, 15 feet away from you, the radiation is very minimal. So if you use your cell phone for an alarm clock, which I suggest you don't do, but if you do, keep your alarm clock 15, 20 feet away from you, get up in the you know, I have a no snooze policy, so no snooze, you get up, you get the phone anyway. Um, but I don't keep the phone by my head when I'm sleeping. And then cool, the cooler you are, the deeper sleep you tend to have. Um, that's one of the triggers to the body to go to sleep is the body is warm, gets cooler, nighttime. This is one of the reasons you, you should not necessarily work out an hour before you want to go to bed because that raises your body's temperature. And I can talk about the kind of optimal times to exercise coming up. But typically, you know, uh, where we live, we call it the central planners, we can't control exactly our air coming into our unit. So sometimes we're opening the windows in January just to kind of balance this out. And then if you're uh, kind of an advanced or crazy biohacker, you might have heard of the chili pad. Uh, my wife was kind enough to let me actually invest in one of these about a year ago. Uh, the chili pad is this mattress topper for your bed. It has silicone tubes in it. You have these little boxes that, that sit at the bed, at the end of the bed, that are chillers. You can dial the temperature from like 95 to 55 degrees. I can tell you 55 degrees is very, very cold to sleep on, and you'll find yourself on the other side of the bed the next morning. So I usually set mine at about 68 degrees. Um, but if your bed partner does not want it to be that cold, they can dial it to whatever temperature they like. And, you know, let's see if I actually have enough. We'll, we'll talk about the minimized blue light and the type of So blue light at night, is really the key at protecting your melatonin. You don't want to see blue light once it's sunset. So things that can mitigate that are get a good pair of blue blocking glasses and offline I can tell you some of the uh, manufacturers that make these things. Um, you know, side note, a lot of companies are trying to make these blue blockers and it really does have to be specific what wavelengths of light they block. Blue light blocking is a marketing term for some of these companies and quality absolutely matters with it. Because if you buy blue blocking glasses and they're not blocking certain wavelengths of light, you're not getting the benefit that you think you signed up for. So if they're extremely clear glasses, they're calling blue blocking glasses, they're blocking the less intense blue light. So that'll help you when you're in front of a computer so you're not getting as much glare, less, less eye fatigue if you're wearing those. But it's letting a lot of blue light through, your melatonin levels are gonna get depleted with that. So if your sleep is affected, you do need to go to more of the amber or the darker lenses. If you have significant sleep issues, then I'd highly recommend considering the red glasses. The red glasses block 100% of the blue light, 100% of green light, which also can be stimulating to some people. Those glasses basically tell your brain, it's midnight, it's pitch black outside. I don't know uh, how much I can usually stay awake more than 30 minutes if I have those things on. Um, they're pretty crazy. You think there's no way these glasses can make me tired. You don't have the glasses or you know, you need to do some other things you know, out in general public. Uh, there's a couple of apps you can use for your computer. F-Lux or Iris are two of the better ones. Iris is probably a little bit better because it uh, controls the flicker rate a little bit better than F-Lux. But these software programs dial down the amount of blue light on your computer screen. There are comparable things to the night shift mode for iPhone. There's something else on the joys, I don't remember what they exactly call it, but also will dial down the amount of blue light coming off your technology at night. Um, side note, you know, if the technology manufacturers are making it do that, they have to know that that is affecting your sleep and your you know, well-being if they had that feature. So just do one step better, block it yourself. Um, on my phone here, which I can show people, um, I actually have a screen overlay for it. It's like a $20 piece of plastic that's yellow tinted. So previously when I was up more on night call, which was horrible for my biology, and that's the reason I, one of the reasons I kind of switched up to my new practice where I'm controlling my circadian rhythms and I'm not waking up in the middle of night for emergencies because I'm playing the long game. I want to be here for you guys for you know, 40, 50 years. My goal is to beat my grandma Ola who lived 106 years old. So I can't be doing night call for the rest of my life. So I control my circadian rhythms. I put this thing on my phone because then I could use my phone, if I didn't have my glasses immediately available, no blue light was coming from my phone. So this is also helpful for kids. 
Um, my nieces and nephews, uh, they're not always so excited about Uncle Mike's blue blocking glasses. Um, yeah, especially my one niece that's a uh, point of contention. You know, oh, you're still wearing those glasses, Uncle Mike? Yeah, I'm still wearing those. So, you know, maybe you can at least get the kids to put the screen protector on their devices so that at least, you know, they're knocking you down somewhat. All right, so there's always a joke about things. Like, you don't have to put the headlight on, but in my house, you actually do. Um, if you saw my house, it's actually pretty funny. I know John has it too at his house. You know, at nighttime, it's very rare that I have anything that's bright on. You know, we turn on different red light bulbs in the house. Um, and so our house looks like a submarine or a house in repute. And uh, you know, we live in a high rise. And actually, if you're outside our building, we, every night we go walk around the park. We can see our house is irradiating right into the subdivision. And they're like, I always wonder what the neighbors are thinking. But, go cards. Yeah, yeah go, go cards. Go cards. All right, so exercise. You know, as a cardiologist, yes, I have to recommend exercise, but you're not going to actually um, know what exactly I think is optimal compared to what a general cardiologist. So, yeah, you know, I'm the cardiologist who says don't do chronic cardio. You know, if you absolutely love to run, run. But if you want the optimal cardiac conditioning, you want to focus more on interval training. So, if you've never done interval training, you probably need to work your way into it. If you're a certain age. You may even need a stress test before you start going to do interval training. So I'm not going to recommend you do this on your own without some physician supervision, and I'm not yet all your doctor. So if you see me, I can tell you, if you're, I'm not your doctor yet, take this as a word of advice, talk to your own doctors about this. But um, interval training is essentially getting your heart rate almost to the maximum it can get to, holding it there for 10, 15 seconds, 20 seconds, and letting your heart rate come down to 60, 70% of your maximum. So if you have a heart rate strap or watch, you can kind of measure that. If you don't have those devices, you can kind of tell by how hard you're breathing. So if you're pushing so hard that you can't hold a conversation with somebody, you're probably at 75, 80% of your maximal. If it's really easy to hold a conversation, you're probably at 60% or less of your maximal. So push it hard for 15, 20 seconds, wait 60 seconds until your heart rate goes back down, push hard again, and maybe you're doing that for seven to 15 minutes. If you could easily do it for 20, 25 minutes, you're probably not pushing it hard enough you should be fatiguing by 10, 15 minutes at the longest. Um, I'll come to them in a moment. So that's kind of the cardio part of it, um, but I'm really a big proponent of talking about resistance training or strength training. So if you sit in with me, I'm asking people, you know, how much time do you do you know, machines, free weights, body weight exercises, and the answer generally is none, because we're not usually conditioned to think that weight training is important for longevity. You know, I'm not suggesting people go get you know, ginormous ripped. If that's your goal, you know, the programs I've described are not for you. But you know, doing some type of resistance training twice a week, minimal effective dose, I'm a lazy exerciser. I want to do the minimal that gives me the maximal. Um, they actually have a device here, this special bar, where you really could probably only do 10 minutes uh, and you're wiped out. Um, that device really helps through the different ranges of motion um, and fully fatiguing the muscles. So. There's a doctor that I've been corresponding with, and you might have seen her on Instagram, Dr. Lyon. Um, she practices something called muscle-centric medicine. So she always talks about muscle mass being the like, an organ of longevity. The muscles aren't just for moving around. They secrete all these different hormones and things that are very anti-inflammatory. It helps control your blood sugar. Cholesterol or fats go into the muscle or burn for energy. So the more muscle mass you have, the better you are going forward. So, you know, we'll talk about what simulates the muscles, but a side note, my brother, um, two months ago, fortunately, he's made a full recovery, but he had viral meningitis. He was very, very sick. He said basically a medically induced coma for four days. He's a very fit firefighter, um, went in the ICU. When he left the ICU, he was about 12 pounds lighter. It was almost all 12 pounds of muscle that he lost. That muscle is basically the bank, it has all these amino acids in it. So when he was really sick, these amino acids got broken down to repair his brain. If he didn't have that muscle mass, he probably would have still survived, but he might have been in the ICU longer. He might have had a longer rehab. Fortunately, now he's back 100%, back to work, back to usual strength, back to playing ice hockey. So thank God he made a full recovery. But the one thing that really helped him out is he had a lot of muscle mass going into this event. Not saying you're going to have tons of muscle mass when you're 80, but the more that you can hold on to, the better you tend to do. And the things that stimulate muscles, you know, when you're younger, 
you can get away with a lot more things. You can eat a lot more junk. Your hormones are much more effective when you're younger. You'll probably put on muscle mass. But after about the age of 40, if you're not doing resistance training, you might lose up to a half pound of muscle per year unless you keep stimulating the muscles with this activity. And resistance training is key, but also the timing of the protein that comes into your system to stimulate something called muscle protein synthesis. Exercise simulates that, but the timing of your protein does. So according to the research, you probably should shoot for at least 30 grams of protein three times a day, bare minimum, if you're trying to maintain and grow your muscle mass. You may need more protein if you're trying to build a lot of muscle mass, but this is a kind of caveat. You know, if you have significant kidney disease, you have significant heart disease, you don't necessarily want to do this without doctor supervision. But if you're a healthy individual, 30 grams three times a day is going to maintain and help you grow your muscle mass. These two gentlemen, one you know, is the number one golfer, one's the number one tennis player. Many years are on the top. You know, what's the difference? Tiger tended to break down a lot. And why did he break down? He never really let himself recover as well as Roger Federer did. Roger Federer was a pro at recovering. Woods, it was rumored that you know, had bad sleep issues. He'd get up at two o'clock in the morning, he'd go run a 5K, he'd go lift weights. Totally against the circadian biology. You know, Tigers, you know, 43, 44 years old, had multiple back injuries, spine surgery, like that's not normal. Yes, you know, golfing and the rotation, maybe do some stuff, but why was he thrashing his spine? He was exercising at the wrong times of the day. He was pushing too hard. He really wasn't letting himself recover. So one of the things that you can do to measure your ability to recover is something called your heart rate variability. You can measure your heart rate variability with different heart rate straps or watches. I know the Apple Watch is uh, reported to be able to record heart rate variability. I had the first gen Apple Watch. I've not upgraded to the new ones because of certain uh, EMF concerns that I have, so I won't upgrade to the new ones. I don't know if the new ones track heart rate variability sensitive enough. When I had the original Apple Watch, it did pretty good with my heart rate at rest or heart rate up to about 130, but if I really pushed it hard exercising, it never really was all that accurate for me. So I typically recommend the chest strap if you're really going to measure this variable. But the heart rate variability is measured on basically an EKG lead. So for myself, where those big spikes are, that's when the bottom chamber of the heart is beating. And there's a time between each heartbeat, which can be measured. If you're a healthy individual, when you breathe in, that time expands. When you breathe out, it contracts. So your heart rate is not supposed to be like a metronome where it's beating 70, 70, 70, 70. You should breathe in, go up to 80, breathe out, go down to 60. It's kind of accordion swinging. The more it can swing, the healthier your heart is. But the way athletes could use this, it's a good marker for how recovered are you. So a good way to do this is there's some free apps that you can download on your phones. You take a heart rate variability measurement in the morning. Typically it's like a one minute reading or a five minute reading. You get a baseline for a few days, see what your number is, go out there, do whatever exercise routine you're doing, record your number the next day and see. If it's steady, keep working out the way you were doing. If your heart rate variability gets really tight, maybe you're overtraining, so maybe do a lighter day or take an off day and let that heart rate variability recover. Because if you push your body too hard and you're not a professional athlete and you have to keep pushing yourself too hard, you will not necessarily get those gains. So, you know, when I ask people, you know, what exercise are you doing? They're like, I walk 20 minutes a day. I'm like, that's outstanding. You should be standing a lot. You should be moving a lot. You should be walking a lot. But walking is not necessarily exercise because classical exercise is you're providing some stress to the body. You're basically doing damage to the body that the body has to do a condition improvement so it doesn't get damaged the next time it does it. Walking, you're not putting enough stress to the muscles or the heart to really make a condition to do a different change. You should definitely, definitely walk, and I walk every single day, but you need to do something more vigorous to count as exercise. If you're sick and inflamed and not sleeping well and you exercise, you're just throwing more stressors on the body. It's just gonna be harder for the body to repair itself. So that's why we start with sleep first. Dial in your sleep, then focus on the exercise. Stay active, but then if you're gonna be a really hardcore exerciser, make sure your sleep's dialed in, because then that's when you'll really will get the biggest gains in muscle, and you'll be able to recover better from your hard cardios. Um, then I thought about this, so yeah, let's get that. All right, so I know they got a Juve device in over in the back. Um, Juve is just one manufacturer of the uh, 
uh, red light boxes or the photobiomodulation or the LLLP devices. The, you know, the way those acronyms are is low level laser therapy because it was initially lasers that they were using. Um, it was actually very, very popular and still is in the um, kind of equestrian world that you use these red lasers to uh, fix the horse's shoulders and such. Um, many uh, kind of body work chiropractors have been using it for many years. It's now kind of bleeding over into the biohacking world. Um, PVM stands for photobiomodulation, so light, bio, biology, modulation, changing something. So using light to change your biology. So the best light is always going to be sunlight. Sunlight, your body has been conditioned to for thousands and thousands of years. Evolutionary, you used to spend 90% of your time outside, 10% inside. Humans 200 years ago flipped that. We have a huge boom in chronic disease since we flipped that. So the more you can reconnect with nature, the less likely you are going to have these chronic diseases. So yes, do I have a red light box? I have a couple of them. Do I recommend them? Of course. But it's always with a caveat. You need to be using the sun first and then supplementing with the light boxes. You know, we're now getting the part of St. Louis where the sun is going to be out, but you're not going to be able to make vitamin D on your skin, even if you had no clothes on because of the way of the angle of the sun during the winter time. It's still beneficial to go out there if it's cold. There's different colors coming from the sun that set your hormones for the day, but you're not making vitamin D through the wintertime in St. Louis. The red lights can somewhat supplement the stuff that the sun you know, can't do this time of the year. So red light is very therapeutic. You know, if blue light is stimulating to wake you up, red light is calming. So the red light, for the most part, I don't believe it's somewhat like it's recharging your batteries, and I'll talk about that in just one moment. But red light, from a musculoskeletal standpoint, is probably the biggest use of it, is it just lowers inflammation in your muscles, so the muscles will be less sore. Uh, for people who want to worry about wrinkles, it helps boost collagen. So, you know, if you put it in your face 10, 15, 20 minutes, you'll likely have less wrinkles. And then, you know, the way I usually think about it more is it's help charging your cellular battery. So that red light really is charging up your personal battery. Um, talk about sunrise and CT, cold thermogenesis. This is the, uh, the coldest day of St. Louis. And yes, I was standing outside there that day watching that sunrise. It's still very beautiful. Sat my circadian rhythm for the day, and then I went back inside. So um, sunrise is important for your circadian rhythm. Don't necessarily think I have a slide on. Oh, I do. Yeah, CT. We'll talk about it. Um, so this is a biohacking thing that I learned from Dr. Jack Cruz. Dave Asprey also frequently talks about it. And the gentleman in the top right is Wim Hof, the Iceman. Um, he's you know, done some amazing uh, feats of uh, strength, let's say, and he's conditioned himself to be very cold adapted. Um, you know, it's in like you know an Arctic Circle, cutting a hole, jumping in the water. You know, he ran like a marathon, uh, like. At the Arctic Circle with like no training. Uh, side note, he smokes like crazy and he's a vegan. And he's still <laughs> able to do these things because he's so cold adapted. The way that cold actually works is that cold makes the mitochondria more efficient at making energy. So superconductors and computers, when you want them to work really, really fast, they cool them down with like liquid nitrogen. Essentially, this is what you're sort of trying to make your body do is make the electrons, the things that go through mitochondria that spin things to make energy, it goes faster the cooler that they are. And the reason I have Michael Phelps there is there's um, reports that, you know, he was routinely training in 55 degree water. You know, that's the same temperature as the Pacific Ocean. You know, that would be cold to you and me if you were never conditioned to it. But once he was conditioned to it, and then he became so efficient at it, you know, there's they have, there's data, you know, he was eating, quote, 10,000 calories a day. But his mitochondria, his engines, were so fine-tuned by his cold therapy and everything else he did, those 10,000 calories didn't mean anything. He threw them right then there and just burned them off. He never stored it as fat. He didn't need to because his engines were so efficient. Um, but that's one theory that, you know, yes, he was an extremely talented swimmer, but that he was cold adapted probably gave him this significant advantage once they were swimming in warmer waters. And Dave Asprey, you know, the founder of Biohacking Term, you know, that's a cryo chamber. There's a couple different cryo chamber places here in St. Louis. I've done them. They're fun. They're interesting. You know, you feel good for a few minutes, but the actual health benefit is probably much shorter term than they actually claim. Um, it just doesn't um, stimulate the uh, 
brown adipose tissue that you really need to stimulate with more chronic exposure, mostly through water. One more time. All right. Going back. All right, so eat seasonal. Time-restricted eating. That's the next big pillar I talk about in nutrition. So the time of day is the other thing that set your circadian rhythms. So 24 hours a day, you can drink waters, totally fine. But there's a good book called The Circadian Code by Dr. Panda, like the animal. The Circadian Code has all the science behind it, but the gist of it is you wanna to try to eat all your nutrition within a 12-hour window per day. If you're sick, trying to lose weight, trying to sleep better, you probably wanna dial it down to a 10-hour window. This includes, unfortunately, black coffee. This is in contradiction to the, the Bulletproof Diet where he says, you know, drink your Bulletproof coffee and you're good to go till noon time and it doesn't break your fast. It might not break the, uh, like your insulin fast, but it does set off the liver and gut clock for the day. Maybe it doesn't, but if you're really trying to be optimal, don't take the risk. So anything that isn't water that goes in your mouth, start your clock for the day, 12 hours at that point, stop. So. The key is be done three to four hours before you go to bed. The more you can focus on the time, the better your sleep quality is gonna be. That's probably the number one thing most people will realize is that they sleep better if they do this. The other thing is that if you're somebody who has issues with glucose control, you're twice as insulin sensitive in the morning time as you are in the evening. So eat a more heavy carb for breakfast than in the evening and finish earlier. Your body can handle blood sugar more effectively in the morning time. Um, and then body composition, body composition will get shredded if you do this, I think. You know, um, the more you can time restrict eat, you will lose weight without much effort. You don't even have to necessarily change what you're eating in that window if you change up the time. Basically in the book, they fed the animals McDonald's the exact same amount of calories. The one could eat for 24 hours a day, they got overweight, they got diabetes, they died sooner. The other ones ate McDonald's for 12 hours, didn't have the problem. You know, back to Michael Phelps and those guys, you know, there's rumors that Usain Bolt was eating chicken nuggets the week he went, the, you know, got the gold medal. His mitochondria worked super awesome. Did not matter the fuel that went in there, it turned it into electrons, his mitochondria did what it needed to do. So food quality does matter, but it doesn't matter to the be all end all of health. Focus on the mitochondria. So you fix the mitochondria by timing the meals when stuff comes in. Um, then the other thing we're going to talk about is protein. We're going to talk about timing 30 grams three times a day. And another thing I typically <coughs> talk about is the um, eventually the DHA component. So DHA of uh, omega-3s is very important for energy in your cells. You do not burn DHA for energy. You basically use DHA as something that captures energy from your environment and then shuttle it to your cells to run all the processes. You'll deplete DHA with too much blue light. So that's why you gotta continuously eat the seafood to replenish the DHA levels. All right, that's enough nutrition. <coughs> Back to the light talk. So you know, there's a guy, Dr. Uh, Matt, well, there's a Dr. Wunsch, who's a German, who's also the light expert. We listened to one of his talks in Germany. Unfortunately, his talk was in German. So we just gotta look at the pictures and figure out, okay, maybe we should do something like that. But there's a gentleman, uh, Matt Maruka, who's a very uh, impressive speaker. He's like 19, 20 years old. He's literally one of the world's experts in explaining you know, how light affects biology because he was so messed up from an artificial light environment from a young age. Um, and he you know, was very big into blue blocking glasses. He actually started his own company for that. But he always talks about something called the light diet. So I kind of incorporate a lot of the stuff he talks about in the light diet. But the light diet essentially is control your artificial light at night and then you get sunlight that sunlight is charging up your batteries. There's a very good book by Dr. Pollack, Jill Pollack, called The Four Phase of Water. So obviously there's you know steam, there's ice, and there's liquid water, but there's this phase of water where it's more of this gel. And this gel water essentially is a battery where the positive and the negative charges are separated. Typically, that uh, happens when infrared light hits it, or UV light has it, so mostly sunlight. So you can literally charge up your water in your cells with sunlight and use that energy. So this is probably one of the reasons where if you go to the beach, you tend not to feel as hungry. Because one, if you do it right, you're barefoot in the sand, you're getting a lot of sunlight that's charging your batteries. 
you don't need as many electrons from food because you're getting the energy from the environment. There's me earthing in Puerto Rico. Oh, there you go. I did talk about this case. The only thing I did talk about this one is um, the water. The water your mitochondria make is actually the most important water. Um, you typically want to, you know, do the things that make the mitochondria work better. Timing the needles, getting the DHA, getting the sleep. But, you know, if you're ingesting water, which you should, obviously I recommend drinking water, um, is you just want the water to be fluoride free. And it's not an argument, does the fluoride make your tea stronger or not? But fluoride blocks the amount of energy that water can store. It's, it's called a dielectric blocker. You don't need to know that term, but anything that's a metal that's in water doesn't let it absorb as much energy. So you want water that came from nature. So that's gonna be mostly spring water, if it's available in your area, or glacial water. You know, um, I'm not, you know, preferably it comes in a glass bottle, but you know, if you had to choose between good waters and a plastic bottle or not having good water, take the plastic bottle. So I'm gonna be flying tomorrow. My first stop, the second I get past TSA security is I go to the gift shop and I'm a water snob and I find the best water I can find. It's always gonna be a plastic bottle at the airport. I usually find Avion or something that's a glacial water and say, I want that one. It doesn't have fluoride in it. And I hydrate up like crazy on the plane because that helps with dehydration and you help reduce jet lag, the better hydrated you are. So drink clean water. I know you probably have a question about like, you know, what is, you know, I have a certain filter, I have an RO filter or this, whatever you like to do, do it. But one challenge with the RO stuff is it tends to be very pricey to install and then you're stripping out all the minerals. If you know what you're doing and know how to put the minerals back in, go for it. I'm not that good at that. So I got lazy. I just had this dude deliver 15 bottles of spring water to my house every few weeks. And then I get to do 50 pound squats lifting things into my place. Um, but you know, whatever water you like, stick with it. Stress, uh, stress management, everybody has stress in their life. How you deal with it determines kind of how your biology responds. So everybody has this fight or flight response. You need it, you know, if the saber tooth tiger's chasing you, you need to go. But what happens is if you have chronic stress, your blood sugar gets sticky from the cortisol, your blood pressure goes up because you need to pump blood to your brain, your muscles to run faster, and then your platelets are stickier because if you're injured, you don't want to bleed to death. So, you know, something's chasing you, something bad's happening, you know, fight or flight goes up, and I talked today to a bunch of firemen, tones go off, yeah, they're going level 10 right away. But how fast can they get back down to normal? That's the key. So you have two systems. You have a parasympathetic and a sympathetic system for your autonomic nervous system. So the sympathetic's the fight or flight, the parasympathetic's the rest and relaxation. So too many people get stuck in this fight or flight all the time. And things that can stimulate the parasympathetic are things they have on the screen. So stimulating your vagus nerve, which is a nerve that goes from your brain, down your neck, stimulates the heart, stimulates the intestines. Deep breathing stimulates this vagus nerve, ramps up your parasympathetic tone, pulls this more into balance. So deep breathing exercises, so this box breath where you're doing four seconds around each way, yoga, meditation, you know, I've been meditator for about three years. You know, everybody who's a new meditator always wonders like, are you doing it right? You know, I use all sorts of different apps to try to figure out how to do it. Now I'm, I'm not an expert, I'm, I'm pretty good at it, but you still, it takes a while to get used to, you know, is this normal? You know, your mind is not supposed to be a blank slate when you meditate, it's that your mind goes somewhere and you just realize it and you try to get it to come back. And the better you can do that, the, the deeper levels of meditation you can do. Side plug is if you're a good meditator, there's a float tank place right across the street here. <coughs> um, floating is one of the best things for relaxation. And if you're a deep meditator, you'll go into these crazy dream states meditating in a float tank because there's nothing else to think about. Um, but one thing you can do from a um, neurofeedback standpoint or biofeedback standpoint is there's a device called HeartMap that plugs into your phone, clips to your ear, it measures your heart rate, and it measures that heart rate variability that we talked about earlier. It will tell you basically are you under that fight or flight response or the relaxation response. And there's different breathing exercises you do, and it gives you immediate feedback if you're doing it, quote, right, and you know, how relaxed are you. So 
I find this very useful for patients who are, have a lot of anxiety, a lot of blood pressure issues or sleep issues. They can train their body to cool these things down. Those issues tend to get better. So this is one of the best non-pharmaceutical treatments for stress relief and blood pressure control. That's what it looks like. Plugs into your phone. I may actually have one in my pocket. Um, I'll just has a lightning cord, plugs in, and has a little clip that you just clip to your ear. That's what it looks like. Different heart rates. The more coherent you have, the more up in the green levels you're going to be. If you're, you know, basically, if you're coherent, your heart is happy. You have these nice waves. If it's incoherent, it's all jaggedy. And this is a great quote I like to end with, and then we'll open up to Q and A. Is you know, basically, try to prevent the disease is the key. So, you know, I'd rather uh, work with people before the disease is fully uh, prevalent. So, uh, thank you all for your attention, and uh, you know. We'll open up the questions and then I'll kind of uh, do any show and tell that anybody wants to see. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Is that calcium score screening test covered by insurance typically? Not generally because it's a preventative test, but most places in the list do it for about $100. Um, you know, there's probably three imaging centers that do it for that price. You know, typically, if you do it at a hospital, they're going to charge $125 to $200. Are you doing it? Uh, yeah, I do not have the scanner, so yeah, because the CT scanner is a big honky yeah. machine, you need a whole room and a tech to run it. Yeah. So I don't do that in my current practice. I, I outsource that one, um, but I will be offering the carotid endomedial thickness scan in my office, and then also this endopat. I'm, as far as I know, the only one in St. Louis offering the endopat. This has been fascinating. Thank you. I've You're got welcome. several questions, but I'll on when you talk about calcium versus plaque. Is that the same thing? Not exactly. Sometimes I'm uh, kind of skipping over the word. Is that plaque is stuff that's building up in the walls of the artery. And plaque is either soft or hard. The soft is more kind of gooey, you know, inflamed plaque, where if it's harder plaque, it's already started to calcify. It basically turns into bone inside the blood vessel. Okay. And then um, is that reverse? Talk about that reverse. Of is it reversible? Uh, there's data that it should be at least partially reversible. It may not go back to zero, but the goal is, you know, A, don't let the plaque rupture. And that's the golden, you know, holy grail of cardiology is to know 60,000 miles of blood vessels, there's plaque going to be in there. Which of these plaques are actually going to cause a problem? Because many people will die and will have plaque in their arteries, but they never had an event. It's really hard to kind of figure out who those people are not going to be who have the events. So that's where the kind of the blood markers tell you, are your arteries on fire? Well, that's a high risk person. But there are different, the lifestyle stuff I talk about will definitely help, you know, the stress relief, the exercise, the sleep. You know, there's certain nutrients and supplements that have been shown in small studies to regress it. And then the conventional world, yes, there are medications that have been studied where they're putting IVs that have special ultrasounds into the blood vessels, and they're showing that that plaque is shrinking down. So I didn't hear you talk much about the fact that a lot of physicians are immediately going to prescribe statins. It's very, you know, very common. What are your thoughts on all? Statins are a tool, and I, I'll use them routinely in the right population. So I'm not pro-statin, anti-statin. You know, um, I know there's, you know, there's groups of people that think statins should be in the water, and there's groups of people that think that statins shouldn't be given to anybody. You know, I learned from wise teachers, you use the tool that works for that patient that's you know, the least you know, likely to cause any side effects. And I'll use that CT coronary calcium score as that tiebreaker at many times that, you know, I tell patients, you know, the same story with cholesterol, like cholesterol's not there to get you, but if you're already putting plaque in your arteries, you're already indicated to me that You've done something in the past that your cholesterol is getting damaged and it's getting trapped in there. There's data that if you take a statin with a high calcium score, you're less likely to go on to have a heart attack or stroke. And certain statins actually regress the plaque. So I will use it in people who have high calcium scores to help stabilize things. But if somebody has a calcium score of zero, that person's not likely to benefit from the statin. 
guess there's some rare genetic abnormalities, less than 1% population, that they should still take the statin probably to reduce the risk from having excessively high cholesterol for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. But statins, they get a bad rap sometimes because if somebody's very vitamin D deficient or they're very under active thyroid, they're going to get side effects from the statin. So I will use my blood markers to figure out are they likely to have those issues? I'll replete those things. And then I can kind of fine tune if they're gonna take a statin, which one they're most likely to respond to without an issue. And one last thing on the statins is as you get onto a stat, does your body start to physiologically adapt to that to where can you get off a statin? Two separate questions. Does your body respond to it? I mean, the way statins work from a cardiovascular standpoint is one, it blocks a certain enzyme that's making cholesterol, so you're gonna make less cholesterol. But your body's also very good at recycling cholesterol that's made, so some people hyperabsorb, so if you wanted to get it from both sides, you gotta block it in the gut so that cholesterol's not getting reabsorbed every time. There's different medicines that do that. Now, can you, quote, get off statins? Yes and no, but you're likely your lipids are going to go back to where they were before the statin, unless you change something else in your environment. Um, yeah, I'm bigger focusing on the inflammation story first. You know, if they have inflammation, focus on that. Yes, it's gonna probably affect the lipids or the cholesterol. I use the lipids and cholesterol a little bit interchangeably. They're not exactly interchangeable, but, um, but there's a lot of pleiotropic or other effects that statins do other than lowering cholesterol. And that's probably the main way that they actually work in my mind is that they lower inflammation and they put thicker caps over plaque that's already present. That's what I want to do is put out the fire, stabilize the plaque so that it doesn't rupture and cause a heart attack. That absorbing cholesterol is important, yes, but it's not the most important thing that's happening. The wake up in the middle of the night at three or four o'clock in the morning, can you explain is that kind of a circadian thing that's going on? Is that a melatonin thing? Um, what would you? It's probably, a. Um, it can be multifactorial. So, I mean, it can be for women, it can be progesterone issues. Um, so, you know, if you, know, you do all the kind of circadian biohacks I'm talking about and you're still having issues, work with one of the functional integrative docs and Don who understands the real way that female hormones work, make sure your progesterone levels are optimized. Um, but from a circadian rhythm and melatonin uh, story is that if you're exposed to more blue light than uh, regenerative light at night, you're depleting your melatonin that you've been making throughout the day. The pineal gland won't be able to secrete as much because you need three to four hours of darkness before that melatonin gets released. If you've destroyed most of it because you sat in front of a laptop or iPad and lay your head down at night, you'll probably be able to fall asleep, but you basically run out of melatonin three to four hours later, the mitochondria regeneration stops and you wake up. So. This is extremely common in kids. You'll see them wake up in the middle of the night because they shouldn't have hormone issues. It has to be melatonin for the most part. You know, there's some other weird reasons they might wake up, but you know, if your kids are playing with their iPhones till 10 o'clock at night and wake up at two, three o'clock in the morning, it's melatonin until proven otherwise. And yes, you could try to give them more melatonin, but fix their light environment in the first place, they're likely to sleep through the night. Kind of on that subject though. So I have my phone set to the night mode, mm -hmm. just to the sunrise and sunset. Uh, would you find it more beneficial just to leave it on the night mode all throughout the day? Personally, yes. Yeah. yeah I mean, because you're going to have to... Is it really going to affect the melatonin production that much, I guess? Like the... I mean, it's it's cumulative. I mean, you know, right. you know the lights are all sitting under right now, the, gotcha. you know, everything else, okay. it all builds up. So. Right. As far as the calcium goes, um, the calcium supplements that you take, uh, Prostil, mm -hmm. Anium, Process, and that, uh, does that affect the calcium up in your that's a great question um, you know my kind of standard answer is that you know if you have osteoporosis or osteopenia where it's just starting to thin out if you do need calcium to stay in the bones taking extra oral calcium for women you know the data is probably a thousand milligrams of supplemental is probably fine for men it's probably zero or maybe 500 milligrams at best if you're getting your calcium through dietary sources, green leafies, or if you can tolerate dairy. Dairy doesn't necessarily have as much calcium as people think. You'd have to drink like six gallons of milk to get the calcium your body quote, needs. So get through mostly the vegetable sources. But it's somewhat of a three ring uh, circus between calcium, vitamin D, and some called vitamin K2. 
So you need enough vitamin D to absorb calcium from your gut. You need vitamin K2 to say calcium, stay in your bones and teeth. So for my heart patients that have calcium in their arteries, I'm frequently using vitamin K2 because it keeps the calcium in the bones and out of their arteries. So somebody already has osteopenia osteoporosis, that's actually a risk factor for heart disease because that tells me the calcium's leaving the bones, it's very possibly it's building up in the heart. Let's go look at the heart. Things that improve it other than just taking supplemental calcium is you know resistance training, but where you guys are sitting tonight, osteogenic loading on the bones makes those bones stronger. So if you can do other things other than supplementing with them, because yes, I you know have had patients who have kidney stones and other things, and you know you start plugging in supplements here, you have a problem here, and now you're trying to fix this problem. So I'm very big in trying to you know, reconnect with nature with all possible is always the number one goal. If nature by itself isn't going to do it, trying to get it through regular food stuff if you can. If you can't, then the cleanest sources of supplements as possible. But knowing that you put something in the system, you might be breaking other systems. Mm -hmm. The screen, uh, thing that you have on your phone, mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how much of that like compared to like wearing the glasses, you know, is it just like an extra layer that you do? Or is it gonna be something like for my teenage boys who like to be on their phones at night till they go to bed in the dark? Correct. And I don't, I mean, they're probably on. That's it. Should that. I guess you should ask a question. How well do they sleep and how well do they feel the next day? You know what, they they sleep fine. Okay. I don't know how they necessarily feel the next day. I mean, you know, at school they're probably falling asleep. You know, I think they get pretty tired. But, you know, is that, how much is that affecting, if they, because they don't have that, they're on their, that blue light. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much is that affecting them as they're like, you know, kids that are still I mean, growing and they're... I mean, until you're 25, your brain's not fully myelinated. So kids and, you know, young adults are more sensitive to this stuff than we are. So, you know, my wife's a developmental pediatrician, thinks they're young kids with, you know, special needs. And, you know, this blue light toxicity issue is huge in kids. You know, there's an epidemic of sleep disorders in adults, but especially in kids. And not saying that blue light is the absolute primal cause of all of it, but it's something you can simply fix by dialing it out of your technology at night. If that works, great, you're done. You don't have to take pills, you don't have to do a thing. But, you know, like I said, my nieces, they don't like the glasses. They're not gonna wear them. They're not cool to their friends. So there's ways you can just put this overlay on it. It's like 20 bucks and it's just done. Now, they're not gonna like the color of it, but like, you just make the rules. You're the parents say, yeah. you want to use your device, you got to have this thing on at night. Yeah. Is the, um, when you do it in your settings on your phone, though, is that the same? Or it is it that gives an effect, but it's not. It's not it's, as good as this, the screen cover. Yeah, because the screen cover will block it 100%. All the time. Yeah. And I'll block it all the time, too. Yeah. What do you do with UV rays? Are you wearing those out in the sun? No, that's a good question. Okay. The, the, the jet cruising people in here are laughing at that. So, uh, so UV radiation is something your body needs. It causes a response. You have different receptors on your skin that respond to UVA radiation. So without UVA radiation, your testosterone levels are not going to be optimized. But this is not saying you have free reign to go lay in a tanning bed because UVA radiation might be healthy. It's dose responsive. So most people don't do it necessarily the right way for their skin. So when I talked about earlier about making this water battery. The water battery is made, you know, when red light from the morning hits it, UV, then red light, because UV goes away, you know, after mid-morning and mid-afternoon. So your body's conditioned to ideally get morning sunlight. This is why the sunrise is so important. Dr. Cruz talks about something called uh, hybrid tanning. So this is where people are like, well, tanning's bad for you. If you know how to do it properly, it's very healthy, and you're not going to burn. The way you do it is not stay in St. Louis every day, go down to Mexico, you've not been outside for six months, and you run out and lay on the beach for 12 hours in January. You're absolutely going to fry, because your skin is not preconditioned to that. So if you go in the morning time, see the sunrise, expose your skin the way you would do during midday and get red light on your skin, your skin gets preconditioned for this UV light. The UV light comes in, 
you get your 10, 15, 20 minutes of light that you need for the health benefit, then you peel back, get it under the shade, you know, wear hats, whatever, and you dial back um, how much UV radiation you're getting. Then if you somewhat overdid the radiation and you did get, you know, the redness of your skin isn't always indicating that you're burnt. That's just dermal pooling. The blood's coming up because the blood wants that radiation to make this water battery. It's basically getting energy into your cells. So just turning red isn't burning per se. But if you then get the sunset, you're getting more ready, red light on your skin, or you could use a juve to kind of augment it too, as that will help basically prevent the sunburn. So red light bookending the UV radiation. But work up slowly. You know, there's five different kind of types of skin. If you're a light hair, freckled Irish person, yeah, you're not going to go out in the sun for 12 hours. If you're equatorial, you're very dark skin, you could be outside for a couple hours before you're going to have to go in. What about the the, port, the, the amount of real estate that's being that you're getting the UV rays or, or the UV light on? It's a good question. That yeah, only for we only do the face and the neck, right? Is it important to do the rest of the body? I basically tell people shine it where it hurts, or what do you want to augment? Um, you know, if you people in here know who Ben Greenfield is, I mean he's got some famous YouTube videos where he's using it where uh, sun doesn't normally shine, um, and that red light can potentially boost testosterone levels. You could do it naturally with the sun too, um, but it's very much so with vitamin D. You know, your body's a solar panel. You know, clothing blocks certain wavelengths of light. That's why it's different color shirts, just because different lights are getting reflected and different lights are going through them. Um, so you need to expose more skin to get your you know, dose of radiation that day. There's a free app called D-Minder that lets you know what time of day to be outside to make your vitamin D. Um, and you basically tell it how much skin's exposed. It has a little GPS thing in it, so if you're in St. Louis, it knows, okay, well, St. Louis is probably right now, I haven't done it recently, but it's probably 11 a.m. to one. It's getting very, very close. We're, just gonna be non-existent for about two months in St. Louis. Further south you go, there's still, you know, six, eight hour window of UV radiation. So d is a very good app to know, okay, I can be outside from 8 a.m. to 10. I don't need any type of, quote, sun protection because I'm not gonna get burned. But after 10, I need to be careful to get my 15, 20 minutes and then peel back. You know, before people have asked the question, what about sunscreen? You know, two rules. One, you know, anything you put on your skin, you should be willing to eat because you're gonna absorb it through your skin. So if you wouldn't drink what you can put on your body, don't put it on your body. Um, but I always recommend physical blockers first. So wide brim hat, you know, I have a couple different rash guards. Yes, I'm gonna go expose myself in Mexico next week, get a lot of sun, but the second I feel like I'm you know, topped up, I'll throw this shirt on for the rest of the day. Dude. On the glasses. The glasses, yeah. I, I, was just, I skipped over it. So, so for optimal, you know, how did Mother Nature bring you into this world? Were you wearing sunglasses? No. So sunglasses should be only on more extreme situations in my mind. I used to be extremely sensitive to light. I got very light blue eyes. Light blue eyes, more UV radiation goes in. You tear up easier. So the second I go outside, boom, glasses on, glasses on. I eventually, within like 10 days, conditioned myself enough that I don't wear sunglasses. Even though I'm going to Mexico, I'm not gonna wear sunglasses for an entire week. I'll bring a hat so it's not getting on my face as much, but you know, if you're skiing or if you're like, you know, driving and the sun's blasting your face, cool, wear the glasses so you can safely do what you need to do. But you need the full spectrum of light to enter your eyes. If you put colored lenses, different colors are hidden back your eyes, you'll make hormones and neurotransmitters differently based off of that. And the UV radiation, they used to thought that like, well, UV radiation doesn't really get back there. A couple percentages of it does. So there's certain receptors in the back of the eye that respond to UVA radiation. Your body didn't put them in there for no reason, so UV radiation is supposed to get in there. All right, well, if there's any other questions, you can come catch me, but um, I do thank you for your attention. And you know, if you're interested in any type of testing I do, I have an office in downtown Clayton. Um, I'm open to new clients and patients. You know, we go through a very detailed history and we kind of go through all these advanced testing. I dial in an exact lifestyle for you, optimal supplements and if medicines are really 
you know, recommend it. I'll explain which ones are actually going to benefit you the most and with the least amount of side effects. Um, I'm very active on Instagram, Dr. Twyman, Dr. Twyman is where my uh, videos are. I'm usually posting a couple times a week. Some of these videos are about you know, blue light or time restricted. So if you know some of this information uh, you need to hear again, it's either on my Instagram or I do have some of the videos on YouTube. So just search for Dr. Twyman, you'll find me. Um, but I do thank you guys for your attention and you know, have a good evening.